let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm David Diesenhaus, lead counsel at Meetup. This is the 12th installment in our Dismantling Social Injustice series of Meetup Live events. You may have joined us for previous events in the series where we've covered issues such as mental health, urban policy, and equal and civil rights for the transgender community. If so, welcome back. And if this is your first time with us, welcome and thanks for joining this conversation. Our goal is to continue fostering important dialogue through events like these. In today's installment of Meetup Live, we'll be discussing historical and contemporary uh, attempts at voter suppression in the US, including a recent trend in legislation that seeks to limit voter turnout and access to the ballot. With me today are our guest speakers, Jessica Ring Amundsen of the law firm Jenner and Block and Jonathan Diaz of Campaign Legal Center. My discussion with Jesse and Jonathan will focus on new laws being introduced around the US that make it more challenging to vote such as laws that limit absentee and early voting, impose ID requirements for voting, and introduce other barriers to casting a ballot. We'll also discuss how these tactics impact marginalized communities and some of the historical precedent and context for these recent changes to state election laws. Finally, uh, in a bit of a switch up from uh, how this event was built, you'll hear from Stephanie Young of When We All Vote, who will share advice for how we can take action now, and then stay tuned for Q&A at the end. So I think we'll just do a quick um, overview of today's agenda. All right. So, oh yeah, I should note um, here are the event guidelines. So this event will be recorded, although you will not appear in the video. Uh, your audio will be muted during the event um, to allow the panelists to speak. Um, you can submit questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, which uh, the panelists and our wonderful event moderators will be able to take in and, address, and we'll address those later in the uh, program. And we have closed captioning, is a, it's available um, to turn it on. You click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. All right, and now onto the agenda. So we will uh, wrap up the introduction in just a few minutes here. And then we'll have a panel discussion with Jesse and Jonathan for about 35 to maybe 40 minutes. And then we'll have a call to action with Stephanie Young from When We All Vote. Um, and we'll finish up with some Q&A. So with that, uh, we will kick things off. And I will introduce the first, of, uh, the first two of our three panelists. Jesse Amundsen is the chair of Jenner and Block's election law and redistricting practice. She represents clients in matters involving redistricting, voting rights, and campaign finance in the US Supreme Court before the Federal Elections Commission and in courts around the country. She has litigated election law and redistricting matters in a number of states, including litigation involving disputed elections. She regularly represents clients on the merits and as amici in direct appeals to the US Supreme Court in redistricting and voting rights cases. In March of this year, Jesse argued before the US Supreme Court on behalf of the Arizona Secretary of State in defending the Voting Rights Act and its standard for bringing vote denial claims. Jesse serves on the advisory committee to the Voting Rights Institute and is a member of the Litigation Strategy Council for the Campaign Legal Center. I'm also joined by Jonathan Diaz, who is legal counsel voting rights at Campaign Legal Center in Washington, DC, where his work focuses on increasing access to the ballot for all Americans. He litigates voting rights cases in courts across the country and advocates for laws and policies to create a more transparent, accessible, and inclusive democracy at the federal, state, and local levels. He has been quoted by the New York Times, Miami Herald, and Reuters, appeared on NPR and Univision, and was a CNN election law analyst for the 2020 election cycle. Great to have you both with, with us. So to kick things off, uh, Jesse, I will present a question to you. Um, you know, help ground us. What changes in state and local election laws are we seeing today in 2021? Well, first, thanks so much, David, to you and to Meetup Live for, for hosting this event about this really important issue. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so we are seeing a rash of new laws proposed and enacted across the country uh, that um, restrict the right to vote in various ways. And so I really see those laws as, as falling into five main buckets. Um, three of those having to do with 
really how people vote. So first are restrictions on voting by mail, also sometimes called absentee voting. And so some of the things that we're seeing being proposed in the various states are things like um, imposing new requirements for signature matching um, on absentee ballots, imposing uh, new witness requirements to have someone witness your signature on absentee ballots, limiting the number of drop boxes where one could can drop off their absentee ballots. Um, so that's sort of the first bucket is, is vote by mail. The second is um, restrictions on early voting. And so in some states we're seeing being proposed cutbacks in the number of days that early voting is available and or the number of hours that early voting sites are open, as well as the number of early voting sites in general that are available to voters. Um, then the third bucket are sort of restrictions and, and um, new regulations on in-person voting. And so there um, we're seeing a number of states that have proposed stricter voter identification laws, voter ID laws, um, where in some states it's been proposed that certain, uh, certain ID won't count for purposes of, of voter ID laws. And then we're also seeing um, restrictions on in-person voting, um, prohibiting people from providing water or things like that to people who are waiting in line to vote. Um, then the fourth bucket um, are, are kind of restrictions relating to voter registration. So there are lots of new proposals um, about requiring officials to purge the voter registration rolls more often and or to uh, eliminate or remove. Um, some states have a system whereby people are automatically sent uh, an absentee ballot if they voted absentee in the past. And so some states have, have tried to eliminate, eliminate sort of the permanent early voting list. Um, and then the final bucket is kind of new restrictions on local election officials. And so um, state legislatures kind of taking back more power for themselves and limiting the discretion of local election officials who uh, often in, particularly in the 2020 election, um, uh, kind of made it easier in some ways for people to vote given the pandemic. So this kind of limits the discretion of, of local election officials. So those are really, uh, there are more, but those are kind of the five main buckets in which these, these uh, restrictions are being proposed. Wow, that's quite a panoply. Um, Jonathan, I, I know Jesse has addressed a ton of uh, various voting restrictions that we're seeing. Any other types that you'd like to add? I mean, that was a pretty exhaustive list, um, but I think the, other, the only other category that I would include are a number of restrictions targeting third party groups, civic organizations, community organizations, religious groups um, who work on things like voter registration drives, get out the vote campaigns, um, really limiting the ability of these organizations to you know, serve their communities by assisting them with, uh, you know, with getting registered and with casting their ballots in person. And so, Jonathan, I, I'd like to um, stay on you for a moment. What, you know, what has accelerated these changes to election laws? Why are we seeing so many? Yeah, so um, there are a few, a few things that I think are contributing to this real explosion in these proposals to, uh, to limit access to the right to vote. Um, number one is that you know, in the last couple of decades, there's really been an increased focus on the machinery of election administration, um, you know, by particularly by political parties and by the candidates, and really realizing that the rules of the election are something that they can, in some circumstances, manipulate for their own electoral gain. Um, and that really came to a head, as I think most people will remember, in the 2000 election, where things like ballot design and uh, the procedure for counting ballots after they had been cast in Florida, where I'm from, um, really, you know, was determinative in, in how the presidential election turned out. And it's only accelerated since then. Um, shortly after that, in, in 2013, um, the Supreme Court ruled in the Shelby County versus Holder case um, that a, a provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, 
called the it's the preclearance formula, which essentially determined which states um, had to submit their election changes to the federal government for approval because of a history of discrimination. Um, the Supreme Court held that formula unconstitutional and basically uh, invalidated one of the key pieces of the Voting Rights Act um, that prevented states from enacting discriminatory challenges that burden the right, to, or, or excuse me, discriminatory regulations that burden the right to vote. And so many of the states where we're seeing some of the most aggressive activity uh, to limit voters' access to the ballot were previously covered by that provision and now no longer need to get approval from the Justice Department in order to make these changes. Wow. And, um, you know, have we seen an, an even greater acceleration since the 2020 election, or is this really just in keeping and, and uh, you know, of the same piece as um, election law changes in the last number of years? It's certainly intensified, I think, since the, since the 2020 election. Um, you know, it was a heavily litigated election cycle. There were, I think, more lawsuits in more states than we typically see, um, including after election day had passed and, you know, efforts, um, you know, not just in courthouses, but in state legislatures um, to you know, undermine the results of the election, um, to change regulations and rules after the fact. Um, and you know, it, the rhetoric around you know, who can vote and the, the integrity and the health of our elections and our democracy has really, really coarsened in the last year and a half. Um, and you know, it's, it's not only damaging in the short term in the sense that you know, if these changes that are being proposed are really going to prevent people from being able to vote, um, but they undermine the the very foundations of our democratic system. And you know, if if a major segment of the population doesn't have faith that our elections are being fairly administered, um, that's really damaging to democracy in the long run. And Jesse, maybe you can help ground us. Um, and where are we seeing the most significant efforts to change voting laws? Sure. Well, um, as, as you and Jonathan were just discussing, these efforts really have accelerated post the 2020 election, although they've certainly been increasing, as Jonathan said, since 2000 and then absolutely since the Shelby County decision in, in 2013. But post 2020, where we are seeing um, a lot of attention focused is in states where there was extremely high turnout of minority voters and where that turnout really made the difference. So for example, in Georgia and Arizona, states that, uh, that really um, flipped their, their presidential uh, vote from 2016 to 2020 and had really record high minority turnout. Those are states where there's also a real focus on a lot of new uh, restrictions on voting. So in Georgia, for example, they introduced a comprehensive bill that, um, that had provisions about, um, about assistance to voters in line, about um, early voting and vote by mail. And there have already been um, seven lawsuits filed against that new, new bill. Um, we're also seeing uh, in Texas and Arizona are both sort of winding down their legislative sessions this week. And there are a number of provisions that, um, that have passed through committee and are likely to, to be uh, enacted sort of likely by the end of this week when the, when the legislatures wrap up. Um, and those are cover a lot of the, of the issues that I discussed at the outset of the, the five buckets of election law. Um, uh, Florida also has recently passed a, a, a new bill that again touches on a lot of the issues that that I um, that I discussed at the outset. Um, I, I will say the one thing that's a little bit different, as as Jonathan said, um, you know these these laws have been accelerating since 2013 uh, in particular, um, but there really is a lot more uh, focus on these laws post. 2020. And we're seeing in a lot of these states actually 
uh, corporations kind of speaking out and coming out against these laws. So, um, so that may have tempered, at least in some of these states, the legislature's um, uh, kind of desire to, to enact these provisions. Oh, and I, I so. want to add, sorry, David, yeah. I just want to add that in addition to some of the states that Jesse listed that are, you know, either emerging or are traditionally competitive, you know, quote unquote, swing states, um, you know, we're also seeing a lot of these changes proposed in states that were not so heavily contested in 2020 and where there wasn't a lot of controversy or lawsuits about, you know, the results where it wasn't particularly close, you know, in places like Iowa and North Dakota and Montana, um, you know, so it really is, you know, a nationwide trend um, in, in lots of different states, not just the ones where, you know, most of the national political attention is focused. Um, you know, there are efforts, uh, you know, big states, small states, rural states, urban states, diverse states to, um, you know, to restrict access to the ballot in the ways that Jesse described at the beginning. So in, in other words, it, it's sort of no matter where you are in the U.S., um, these laws are, are likely passed in your jurisdiction and may very well impact um, your ability to vote and what it looks like next time you go to the polls. Um, so I... Yeah, so Jonathan, I, I guess actually focusing on, on some of those impacts, what are some of the impacts these changes will have or are likely to have? And who is most likely to be impacted by these changing voting laws? Yeah, so I mean, at, at the most basic level, it's going to affect many voters at what I, what I think of as the retail end of, of the election cycle. So when a voter interacts with their local elections office to request an absentee ballot or goes to their polling place to cast their ballot on election day or during an early voting period. Um, in many cases, these bills that are being proposed or passed in states are adding additional bureaucratic obstacles um, that voters, you know, hoops that voters will have to jump through in order to be able to cast their ballots. So for people who have, let's say rural voters with limited internet access, um, or voters who are lower income or maybe working multiple jobs and don't have the time or the flexibility to you know, chase down how, the, how to get an absentee ballot, um, you know, those voters are gonna be significantly affected. Um, for many of the proposals that reduce things like drop boxes or early vote locations or polling places, um, many of those changes are gonna be most heavily felt in predominantly minority communities. Um, you know, one of the bills under consideration in Texas right now, for example, would significantly reduce the number of drop boxes in the majority black parts of Houston. Um, and the same impact would not be felt in the majority white parts of the city. Um, you know, these issues um, in Arizona are particularly important for Native American voters um, who often uh, on tribal lands in some parts of the state will lack uh, access to regular mail services. Um, and who really rely on some of the third party uh, community groups that I mentioned earlier um, to facilitate uh, voter registration drives and you know, getting them you know, mail ballot applications and things like that. And so all of those limitations are really gonna be most heavily felt by you know, really voters across the political spectrum and across demographic groups. It's hmm. significantly voters of color um, but also, you know, elderly voters, rural voters, young people who move around a lot or are maybe living out of state, going to college. Um, you know, there are, there are so many changes um, being proposed that will make it more complicated to cast a ballot. And that's, you know, going to cause not only confusion over what the requirements are for any given voter, but also, you know, in some cases, real obstacles that are going to prevent people from being able to cast their ballot. Really interesting to point out sort of the, the almost universality of, of the challenges that these laws may pose. Um, Jesse, anything else you'd like to add about the impacts of these laws? I think Jonathan mostly covered it. The only other other group of voters that I would add are also being impacted are also um, disabled voters. So there are a lot of provisions being um, proposed and or enacted that limit the um, assistance that someone can give in helping someone fill out their absentee ballot and, and also to return their absentee ballot. So 
um, some of the kind of laws that Jonathan was talking about that target third party groups will significantly affect uh, disabled voters and their ability to have their ballots um, cast and counted as well. So Jesse, um, you know, what do you say to someone who looks at these laws and says, you know, these kind of make sense on their face on the theory that they prevent voter fraud or promote election integrity or, or say, you know, I don't see how these are voter suppression laws per se. Well, David, I guess the first question I would sort of pose back to someone like that is sort of what voter fraud? So um, when you look at, there have been people who've been tracking voter fraud over the, over the years. And for example, there's a, an organization called the Heritage Foundation that maintains a database that's frequently used in litigation about voter fraud. And what that Heritage Foundation database shows is that there are 1,322 quote, proven instances of voter fraud in the United States since the early 1980s. Now, David, we have 168 million registered voters in this country. The number of votes cast since across the country since the early 1980s by these registered voters, and we have is just, you know, incalculable. I, I, I'm a lawyer, so I don't do math so well, but, <laughs> but it's uh, to the fact that there are 1,322 proven instances of voter fraud across 40 years of elections is just kind of, you know, mind boggling when people are talking about voter fraud. So, um, and even, Obviously, voter fraud was a, a major topic following the 2020 election, but um, the 2020 election, by all accounts, or by, by accounts of, of anyone who was in charge of administering the election, was the most secure in history. There have literally been 16 people, one six, 16 people prosecuted for voter fraud since the 2020 election in which we had you know, record turnout. So my first kind of question back is, is really what voter fraud? So um, you know, certainly legislatures are entitled to take some prophylactic measures um, to secure elections. But legislatures should be required to show that the problem that they are attempting to address is a real one and that the solution that they are proposing actually targets the problem that they are purportedly attempting to address. Um, so I'll just point out when I argued in the Supreme Court earlier this year, one of the things that, that I always think about is with respect to campaign finance laws, when legislatures pass laws uh, that try to limit the amount of money that people can spend on elections, the Supreme Court has said, wait a minute, you can't do that unless you first show us that there's actually corruption. Show mm. us some evidence that the problem is real. But courts are not requiring that same sort of thing with respect to voter fraud, and they should be, frankly. Legislatures should have to show that there's a real problem with voter fraud before they're trying to fix something that isn't broken. Hmm. Um, really helpful to hear some of those numbers to, to help put things in context. Um, Jonathan, you know, uh, you know, obviously I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to weigh in on that question as well, but I'd also love for you to address, you know, what do we know about the intent behind some of these laws, either from uh, the legislative record or statements by lawmakers in public media outlets and the like? Sure, I do. I do want to weigh in on on the question that you posed to Jesse, um, because I think it will feed into that question as well. Um, I think another thing to consider is when you're looking at these these laws, these proposals um, that are claiming to address this issue of voter fraud. I think you also have to look at even even if you take the the motivation at face value are these actual solutions to the problem that they're claiming exists? And, you know, are they, or are they causing more harm than good? Um, you know, if I found ants in my bathroom, I wouldn't burn my house down. Um, and that's essentially what some of these proposals are doing, particularly the ones that, you know, are really undermining the ability of local election administrators to conduct elections. 
Um, and when you're thinking about, you know, okay, this law, reading it in a vacuum might not seem so bad. You have to consider what the real world implications of these statutes are. Um, if you're a person who, you know, has a driver's license or a passport, a voter ID law might not seem like such a big hurdle to you because you have your driver's license and you take it with you everywhere. Um, but, you know, there are some people who don't have the means to access the types of ID required. Um, you know, there are folks in the South clients that I have, that I have worked with um, who were born, you know, in rural areas, maybe 70, 80 years ago and don't have a birth certificate. And so they need a birth certificate to be able to get a driver's license. And so they can ask the state for one, um, but that costs money. And they may need to travel a long distance to get to you know, their county clerk's office to get that original document, but they don't have a car. And so all of those costs start to add up. And then you're talking about somebody who may be very low income, may live in a rural community and now has to spend hundreds of dollars and several days, which they may not be able to get off of work if, if you know, they're able to even get to where they need to go, um, you know, just to be able to exercise their constitutional right to vote. And very often those burdens, when they exist, are disproportionately felt by communities of color um, or you know, elderly voters, disabled voters, young voters, the same kinds of groups that we were discussing earlier. Um, so it's not just about, you know, is this law neutral on its face? It's, you know, does it have a disproportionate impact mm -hmm. um, on a group that has been historically excluded from the ballot box. Um, and as far as the intent goes, um, you know, we don't really have to guess in many of these instances. Um, over the past several months, many of the legislators who have proposed these new restrictions, many of the, you know, state election officials who are supporting these changes have said explicitly out loud without really dressing it up that the purpose of these bills is number one to you know to tilt the playing field so that their party can you know more easily win elections because they think that they you know can't win under the current rules um, or number two to address the concerns that some members of their constituencies have about voter fraud or about uh, election integrity that are just unsupported by the facts. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the 2020 election cycle was among, if not the most litigated election in history, certainly up there. Um, and I think, you know, without exception, federal and state courts across the country with judges appointed by presidents and governors of both parties, you know, tossed out all of these claims of voter fraud and uh, you know electoral misconduct because there was there's just no evidence to support any of them. Um, but these narratives have taken hold, um, and so now it's it's a solution in search of a problem. Um, and unfortunately, the result of a lot of these things is going to be excluding um, some of the most vulnerable members of of our communities um, from having their voices heard. About. So Jonathan, just switching gears slightly, I, another question for you is, are there any jurisdictions that are getting it right that are maybe either bucking the trend or um, you know, trying out new election laws or making sure that um, election laws stay in place that sort of promote voting as opposed to promoting voter suppression? Yeah, I mean, there are a few, um, you know, especially I think in the aftermath of the Georgia bill being passed, there was a lot of finger pointing um, about, oh, well, look at this other state who's doing a bad job. And New York got a lot of, I think, well-deserved flack for its election laws. Um, but New York has actually been trending in the right direction for the last couple of years. Um, you know, the legislature has taken significant steps to expand early voting, um, to clean up their absentee voting system um, Virginia just passed a state level voting rights act um, to fill some of the gaps left um, in federal law after the Shelby County decision. Um, and actually Kentucky passed an election law um, you know, with bipartisan support, legislators of both parties, um, a democratic governor, a Republican secretary of state, they worked together um, to pass um, election reforms that expanded access for all voters in Kentucky um, you know, I, I still don't think that 
Kentucky's election laws are perfect, but they are trending in the right direction. Um, they're moving towards making it easier for eligible voters to cast their ballots um, without sacrificing integrity. Um, and so there, there are some signs, some signs of hope. Um, I also want to um, shout out, you know, voters in certain states who have, uh, I think, repeatedly chosen democracy. Um, most recently in twenty in twenty eighteen, um, by ballot referendum, voters in Florida, um, you know, voted to restore voting rights to people with felony convictions in that state. Voters in Michigan, by ballot initiative, um, established an independent citizens redistricting commission and uh, early voting and you know these absentee voting for the first time in that state. Um, so you know there are it it's it's clear to me at least that you know the public will is in favor of um, you know protecting and expanding the right to vote. Um, it's just you know it's a shame that some lawmakers and and elected officials are not uh, not following that trend. Yeah, I mean, so critical to, to think about what individual voters can do. And I look forward to hearing from uh, Stephanie from When We All Vote to discuss that um, in a bit more detail uh, shortly. Um, so Jesse, you know, we've talked a lot about where we are today and I'd love to um, tack back a little and get some of the context and the legal background for assessing um, voting rights claims and the law around voting rights. So I was hoping we could start with the constitution and I think many or all of us have heard of the principle of one person, one vote. Uh, what does the constitution actually say about the right to vote? And where does that principle of one person, one vote come from? Yeah, that's a terrific question, David. And I think a lot of people are really surprised to learn that the federal constitution actually, the, the original federal constitution says very little about the right to vote. Um, that essentially uh, the original document simply says that uh, state legislatures will have the authority to establish the time, place, and manner of holding elections unless Congress provides otherwise. But um, the various amendments to the constitution have, um, have kind of guaranteed and expanded on the right to vote. And so the most notably the, the 15th amendment prohibits denying and abridging the right to vote on account of race. Then the 19th amendment does the same thing, prohibits denying or abridging the right to a vote on, to vote on account of sex. And then finally the 26th amendment um, prohibits denying or abridging the right to vote for those 18 years and older on account of age. So, so that, that the right to vote is those words are actually in the constitution, at least in, in the amendments to it. But to the, to the one person, one vote principle that you referenced, um, that is something that really comes from the 14th amendment of the constitution and its guarantee to everyone of equal protection of the laws. And so essentially what happened was in the 1960s, there were a series of cases um, saying that in, in some states, there were some districts that had way more people in them than other districts. And so one person's vote was not worth the same in one district as, as their um, another citizen in another district. So the Supreme Court um, using the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, said that in fact, we are going to have a principle of, then they did call it one man, one vote, but we have now said, you know, one person, one vote um, for, for elections. And so for most, um, most voting rights litigation, when we talk about the right to vote generally, it's usually grounded in the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, but then also in the First Amendment um, mm. as, as kind of voting has been conceived of as a way for people to express their preferences as well. So the 14th Amendment and the First Amendment are really the major sources of the general right to vote. And then those various 15th, um, 19th and 26th Amendment also have, um, have things to say about how you can or cannot deny and abridge the right to vote. Great, thank you. Um, you know, even as a lawyer, always good to get a refresher on what the Constitution does and does not say. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jonathan, you know, Jesse discussed um, several aspects of the Constitution, but in particular the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments, which were passed in the wake of the Civil War. Um, and and I think critically, both of those amendments say that Congress has the power to pass laws 
enforcing those amendments. Um, so, you know, uh, dusting off my, my history major cap, as I, as I remember, you know, those amendments led to important uh, federal civil rights legislation. And when, you know, combined with the project of reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War, the latter half of the 19th century was really in some ways, you know, a high watermark of voting and political rights for, for Black Americans. But maybe you could touch on what happens next after Reconstruction? Sure, yeah. So in, like, like you said, in the aftermath of the Civil War and the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments, um, during the Reconstruction era, um, you know, that was at that point, um, you know, really a watershed moment for voting rights and civic participation for African-Americans, African-American men, because it was before the 19th Amendment had passed. Um, and we saw, you know, the first Black members elected to Congress, um, particularly in the South, um, and the, for the earliest um, civil rights statutes passed by Congress. Um, but, you know, as, as is often the case um, throughout history, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, um, after the Reconstruction period, um, you know, there was a backlash that came um, during the era, it's sometimes called redemption, um, when, uh, you know, Americans who were opposed to the expansion of political and civil rights um, to Black Americans, um, you know, re-seized control of some of the levers of government, um, and it led to what we now call the Jim Crow era, um, where, you know, by operation of state law, um, you know, many African Americans were denied access to the ballot. Um, and the thing that is, that I think some people either just don't know or maybe forget about um, the period, you know, following Reconstruction leading up to the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s is that the Jim Crow laws in many cases were not explicitly premised on excluding people on the basis of race um, because that sort of explicit discrimination would have violated the 15th Amendment, um, which, as Jesse said, prohibits denying the right to vote on the basis of race. Um, so they were, like many of the laws that we see today, facially, on their face as written, seemed like they neutrally applied, but in application were used um, either through the discretion of election officials or you know, because of selective enforcement um, you know, were used to deny African Americans access to the ballot, things like poll taxes and literacy tests and you know, grandfather clauses that uh, enabled white citizens who didn't meet the requirements of those neutral laws to vote anyway. Um, and so you know, it wasn't until uh, after a sustained period of activism during the civil rights movement um, and that, you know, Congress eventually acted um, by passing first the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and then the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, and the Voting Rights Act not only set certain minimum standards like eliminating literacy tests and poll taxes and things like that, um, but also gave Congress and the Department of Justice an enforcement mechanism to prevent future uh, race discrimination in, in the voting process. Great. No, th that was a, uh, a really efficient uh, march through history. So thank you for that. Um, you know, Jesse, picking up where Jonathan left off, could you describe, you know, the provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act in a bit more detail? I mean, it's, you know, a landmark uh, piece of legislation. And then maybe where those provisions sit today in light of uh, the Shelby County decision from the Supreme Court that Jonathan also mentioned. Sure. So um, the, there are a lot of provisions of the Voting Rights Act, but the two that people mainly focus on are uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and, and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And Section 5 is the provision that Jonathan referenced earlier that used to require um, uh, what were called covered jurisdictions to obtain preclearance from the Justice Department or from a court in uh, DC prior to enacting any change to their voting laws. And so um, this was the, the, the purpose of Section 5 was to ensure that any change to voting laws would not have the purpose or the effect of denying or abridging the right to vote of, of, um, of voters on account of race. And it really had the, the 
effect of, of stopping jurisdictions from enacting provisions that would um, diminish the ability of minority voters to, to um, exercise the franchise. Um, as Jonathan said, in 2013, in the Shelby County decision, the Supreme Court struck down the preclearance formula, um, the formula that decided who had to actually go through the preclearance process. And so effectively, Section 5 is, is no longer um, operative. So all of those jurisdictions, in some cases, some of those jurisdictions, literally the day after the Shelby County provision or the Shelby County decision enacted new, very restrictive voter ID laws and other kind of um, uh, restrictions on the right to vote that never would have been pre-cleared had Section 5 still been in effect. And then the second provision is Section 2. Section 2 um, prohibits uh, election laws or policies or procedures that have the intent or the effect of denying minority voters the opportunity to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. And so it's really important what Jonathan was saying earlier about some laws that are facially neutral yet still have the effect of actually um, discriminating against minority voters. And so post the Shelby County decision in 2013, many more suits were filed against state election laws on the basis of section two. Um, one of those suits uh, involves the case that I argued before the Supreme Court in March. Uh, and this is the first case that the Supreme Court has taken that will um, opine on the standard that will apply to, um, to section two vote denial claims. There are, there's a series of vote dilution claims that the Supreme mm -hmm. Court has decided, but these, this is the first time they've taken a vote denial case. And so uh, the court um, is supposed to issue all of its decisions by the end of June or early July. So we'll have to sort of wait and see what happens with, with section two um, in light of this most recent case. Well, we will certainly be waiting with bated breath. Um, and, and Jesse, just one, um, one more follow-up question on the Shelby County decision. Am I right that uh, the Supreme Court struck down the preclearance formula, but not the preclearance structure or regime? That's exactly right. So by striking down the formula, they rendered the preclearance regime essentially inoperative, but, but you are correct that technically section five is still on the books. Um, Congress just would need to enact a new formula, which is, which is part of the, um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that's currently um, pending in Congress. Well, that is a really excellent uh, point uh, in our discussion to bring in Stephanie Young from When We All Vote to the conversation. Um, so we're now going to be joined by Stephanie, who is an executive director at When We All Vote and senior advisor to Civic Nation. When We All Vote is a nonpartisan and nonprofit voting initiative launched by Michelle Obama in 2018. Stephanie has over 12 years of strategic communications and public engagement experience ranging from the Obama White House, political campaigns, House Democratic leadership, and leading television networks, BET and NBC Cable, Cable Entertainment. And uh, so those of you who have joined us previously may recognize Stephanie from a prior Meetup Live event. So welcome, Stephanie, and I will uh, turn things over to you. Thank you so much for having me. And, and really, thank you guys for having this conversation. I think it's so critically important that people really understand uh, the history of voting in this country. And I'm here to shed some light on, I think, what everybody uh, joining us today actually can do. I think sometimes we all feel helpless um, and feel like, well, it's way too much uh, information and all these states are doing all these terrible things and I have no role in, in creating change. But I'm here to tell you otherwise. Um, when We All Vote's a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organization uh, launched by Michelle Obama, as David mentioned, and we're really on a mission to change a culture on voting, and we've expanded our work, especially for this year, to really take on advocacy. Um, and what that means is that we want to give you the tools and resources to take action um, in your own ways to make sure that not only are you registered and ready to vote, not only are you informed about what's happening in, in Washington, D.C. and in state houses around the country, but you have the tools and resources to actually take action and create more change. If you go to the next slide, um, I, 
in the slide probably after that, um, you know, we've laid out a couple of voting principles um, to really align um, um, our values and make sure that folks who are joining the, our organization understand what we believe in. And that's things like automatic voter registration, ending partisan gerrymandering. If you don't know what gerrymandering is, I'm not sure if you guys talked about that earlier, but what that essentially is, is when politicians are able to pick their voters instead of voters picking their politicians and they create these congressional and state districts uh, that only pack voters that they know will vote for a certain party. That's wrong. Um, closing campaign finance loopholes, meaning giving more access to, to folks who aren't wealthy, rich and famous to, to really um, give to not only campaigns, but to play a role um, in, our, in, in our campaign uh, finances and ensure that just not the rich are picking um, our candidates. Um, you know, from DC statehood to, to territorial voting rights to restoring voting rights uh, for formerly incarcerated Americans. Those are some of the things that we believe in um, at our organization that everybody should believe in if you really do believe in democracy that's free and fair. If we go to the next slide. Um, so I heard um, either Jonathan or Jesse mention the For the People Act at some point. Um, this is a landmark piece of legislation that we really hope uh, to see pass. It's already passed through um, the Senate, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the Congress, um, and we're hoping that it has um, uh, time on the Senate floor for debate. Um, and what this landmark legislation does, it, we're, they're calling it the biggest piece of civil rights legislation since the Civil Rights Act, uh, because voting is a, is a civil right um, here in this country. So. It institutes, this is just some, not everything, but it institutes automatic voter registration. It helps to modernize our voter registration um, systems around the country. In places like Texas, you know, they make it super hard to get registered to vote. Um, if I, as just a Texan, wanted to go, and I did live in Texas, wanted to go and register voters in my community, I would have to get some sort of like, not just clearance, I'd have to go through some crazy training and be certified. It just makes it harder, right? Uh, but we're modern, we want to modernize um, our voter registration system so that 18 year olds can get registered right away. Um, expands early voting. We know that that works. People have jobs and lives and things that they cannot get to the polls on time um, or um, you know day of, uh, but this allows more time, allows universal access to vote by mail, which was huge in a global pandemic. Hopefully we'll never live through that again. But if we did, this really does help. And it also helps people with disabilities and others and people who are just cannot, don't have the means to get to the polls on election day or before. It restores the right to vote for formerly incarcerated Americans because uh, they deserve that right. And again, it ends partisan gerrymandering. So similar to our principles and beliefs, this bill that's gained so much traction, so much attention, and it's gaining momentum, um, really does need your help to actually see a vote on the Senate floor and deserves a vote on the Senate floor so that we can make sure that everybody has equal access to the ballot box. And when people have equal access to the ballot box, that means they have equal representation and they have people that are representing them who value their lives uh, and value their futures. If you go to the next slide. Um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that's so incredibly important. I know you guys just talked about that um, with the Shelby versus Holder decision, which I might add happened right after President Obama um, won his election, re-election in 2013. And, and what that tells us is this, when they see, and whoever the they is, but when they see that a lot of Americans are excited and get out there and go vote, people automatically are like, oh, how do we end this? <laughs> what do we need to do? Um, and the thing about the Voting Rights Act, they know, and we know that there are certain states that have a history of discrimination. I am from one, I am from Georgia, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, all of these places have a history of voter suppression. And what they what did they say? They said, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. We can just take out those provisions and, and the checks and balances won't be there and these states can do whatever they wanna do. And we saw crazy, crazy voter suppression laws, which we are continuing to see right now. So we wanna make sure that we do everything to get this across the finish line and honor um, John Lewis and all of those who have fought for equal access to the ballot box. It helps uh, to, um, uh, you know, decrease some of the crazy uh, voter ID laws that we see around the country. For instance, again, in the state of Texas, you can vote with your gun license, but maybe not with your student ID, which makes no sense. Um, it also helps to restore those provisions that I mentioned um, in those places that have a history of discrimination. Um, and um, uh, months a whole host and number of things. I don't want to go all the way into it considering 
I know that you guys heard a lot about it, but these are two things that you can take action on now, if we go to the next slide, um, to help combat what we're seeing. So yes, the states are doing a whole lot. There, there will have to be action taken in some of the states, but these two pieces of federal legislation will help to end voter suppression because of all the provisions that they have um, uh, to protect voters around this country and to grant equal access. So what can you do right now? We want you to reach out to your federal lawmakers and make sure that they know that you you support expanding voting rights for all Americans. You believe in voting rights. Um, you can go to weall.vote slash for the people. Um, you can also tweet your member, weall.vote slash tweet for the people. We literally, we literally make it easy, guys. So when you go here, we will give you a script to help you have that conversation so you're not awkwardly on the phone leaving a message. They count all these things. I worked on Capitol Hill for many years for, leaders, for uh, uh, leadership and also for one of the caucuses. And what I do know is that members, they count those calls and they count those tweets. And what they will say is, well, you know, nobody's called or emailed and I don't, you know, we don't, my, my district or, uh, you know, my state doesn't really care about this. Well, we have to flood their offices um, with our calls and we can do it every day. Um, you should also take a look at our voting principles. But if you go to our website now, whenweallvote.org, you'll be able to see um, Mrs. Obama uh, and a letter that we sent um, on behalf of her and about 64 of her friends like, um, I don't know, Tom Hanks and others uh, asking the Senate to take up um, the For the People Act. And we have all of the tools and resources right on our homepage that you're able to click on. Uh, but please follow us on social media so you can learn more. We're not just pushing you to do this without educating you on what these bills do. We have a ton of information um, on our social channels to help with that. Um, and we have great folks uh, like Priestley who uh, help lead our partnerships team who are more than willing to help um, give more tools and resources to you guys so that folks really understand what's at, not just what's at stake here, but what, what's in these bills and how can they help to stop the voter suppression we see. And once we take action, it's so critically important that you call your friends and your family to get them to take action too. One person is just not enough. This is a team effort. And we had record breaking turnout in 2020, which shows us like what we actually can do when we all kind of band together against all odds, right? And make our voices heard in whatever way you want to do that. But it's so criti critically important that you do because when you do not, somebody else speaks up for you. And I guarantee you that they might not value you, your life um, or the future that you wanna have. So it's so incredibly important that you guys take action. And we hope that you take action with When We All Vote. We're ready for you to join um, our efforts. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, David. Stephanie, thank you so much for, um, you know, it's always important to understand the issues confronting us, but perhaps even more important to understand the way that we can, um, you know, take matters into our own hands. So um, at this point, I, I want to, you know, take some, uh, some event participant questions and pose those back to our panelists. So let me consult the list. Um, all right, so Jesse, uh, here's a question for you. Um, what did the actions taken to encourage voting access during the pandemic reveal about the state of voting, you know, be it limitations, access and or practices prior to the pandemic, both across the country and, uh, you know, an interesting segment for, for U.S. voters outside of the country? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question. So I think, as, as Stephanie just mentioned, we had, um, you know, record turnout in the 2020 election. And I think part of what we learned is that some of the things that, um, that various states did uh, in both um, allowing greater access to early voting in um, sending out um, vote by mail ballots to voters in, you know, for example, Harris County in Texas um, did a 24 hour early voting site. And so people actually took advantage of that, people who work the night shift, et cetera, and mm. were able to come in at hours that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. So we learned that, um, that when we actually um, kind of increase access to voting, people take advantage of it. And so what's kind of um, implicit in everything that we've been talking about, and I just wanna make explicit is that, you know, people should want more people to vote, right? 
parties should be appealing to voters on the basis of their ideas, not trying to sort of define the electorate to keep people out whom they fear will not agree with them. So, uh, so when when that happened in 2020, when more access to voting was was made available, uh, people took advantage of it, and we should kind of um, keep some of the the improvements that we made in 2020 going forward. Great, thank you. Um, so Jonathan, uh, love to pose a question to you. Um, one of our uh, participants asked, among the tiny percent of voter fraud cases that have actually been prosecuted, what are some more common examples of how the fraud allegedly was perpetrated? And to what extent do they align with the kinds of restrictions that are currently being applied? Sure. Um, so, I mean, first, again, like you said, these cases are extremely rare. Um, and in, I think in most instances, um, they can be categorized into one of two types. Um, you know, sometimes it's a person who mistakenly votes thinking that they were eligible, but because they, but they weren't, um, you know, and, you know, those cases are, are pretty rare. The system, our election system is designed to allow, um, you know, election officials and administrators to catch those things usually before they happen. Um, but really, I think the most, the more common problem that we see is not voter fraud, not fraud by voters, but election fraud by campaigns and candidates. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's still not particularly common because of the way that our election system is designed to, to prevent those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, the, the proposals and the bills that we're seeing, especially this year, um, you know, things like reducing the hours that a polling place is open on election day or having less days of early voting, um, you know, that's not going to reduce the already tiny amount of fraud. That's just going to make it harder for eligible voters to cast their ballots. And so it's, you know, it's not addressing, you know, whatever problems may exist. Um, you know, it's, it's just keeping, it's keeping more eligible voters out of the ballot box than it is stopping any, you know, any fraudulent votes from getting through. Such an important point. Um, so Stephanie, we had a, a question that was directed directly to you. Um, from your experience, how are voters or constituents' voices measured against the voices of lobbyists and large donors? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, Look, I mean, working on the Hill, obviously lobbyists, that's a 24 hour job where they are pushing for issues and all the issues aren't bad that they're lobbying for. There are people who lobby for voting rights and there are people who lobby for gun rights. So, you know, it, 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 it is the entire spectrum. Um, but a lobbyist, obviously, and, um, you know, donors, that, that's campaign funding. And we know that's what a lot of members and senators think about. But at the end of the day, voices of the voters are more powerful. They really are. I think the problem is that we don't always take that action. And so therefore, that one voice, right, um, of knowing I have a guaranteed check probably from this person when I'm running for re-election, I've heard nothing from the people in my state about mm -hmm. this issue. Uh, I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> I'm gonna go with a guarantee. But if they hear a groundswell of people supporting something, right? Just look at the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Today is the anniversary of his murder. Uh, his family went to the White House. I saw they, they went to Capitol Hill. Um, there's actually legislation named for him that never would have happened if folks were not in the streets uh, protesting for against police violence and speaking up on that issue. And that's such a good example to me of what actually happens when it comes to the legislative process and how members of Congress are swayed and moved. They had to see a movement of thousands of people, not just in this country, but all over the world, right? Really taking action and speaking up and standing up for this, right? So voting is going to take a lot of that too. Um, and that even that hasn't, you know, necessarily gotten um, a vote yet. And I know that obviously people, no bill is perfect. So people always have complaints about bills, but I think it's so, you can never, I think, underestimate the power of the people 
and the voice of the people. And what they're mostly afraid of is, is not being elected. So if you if we are able to cause enough noise and ruckus and keep these issues, not just in the news, but we're making these phone calls, we're tweeting, we're consistently having this barrage of, of noise, good noise coming, they can't ignore that. Um, and even the lobbyists or the big donors and funders, um, they just can't stand up to that power. And I just think that we haven't taken advantage of it because we haven't realized that we've got it. Um, but it's going to take a, a, a large collective uh, voice consistently um, on these issues, not just when it, it's cute and it's fun during a big election, but years like now. And I want to add to that, um, you know, Stephanie gave a really great rundown of all of the voting rights and redistricting protections in the For the People Act. Um, but, you know, that bill also includes a lot of really significant campaign finance provisions, um, things like empowering the Federal Elections Commission to, you know, investigate and prevent campaign finance violations, limiting um, coordination between campaigns and super PACs that have unlimited, undisclosed spending behind them, um, requiring disclosure of who is funding online ads. Um, you know, you, I'm sure everyone here has seen you know, when you see a political ad on TV and it says at the bottom of the screen who paid for it and who, you know, who approved this ad, um, that same requirement doesn't apply to ads that you see on social media or on the internet. Mm. Um, and so loopholes like that, um, you know, ways to, you know, add transparency to our campaign finance system are also a huge part of the For the People Act. And another reason, you know, to call your senators and, and, and tell them that you support it. Great. Um, and Jonathan, one question that maybe you'll be uh, well positioned to answer. One participant asked, is there a website or other resource to show what each state's new restrictions or voting requirements are? That is a great question. Um, I think one of the, one of the challenges um, that comes with uh, trying to stay on top of all these things is how Sort of fragmented our election system is and you know every state has their own rules and sometimes those rules can even differ on the county level um so i would say that um if you're looking to see what the rules or changes are in your jurisdiction in particular um your number one resource should be your local election officials um so whether it's your county or your city um it varies based on the state um those officials their websites their publications will have the most up-to-date information for you um, as well as your state election official. In most places, that's a secretary of state. Um, in some places, there's a state election board. Um, and then as far as what's going on on the national level, um, there are a number of really great nonpartisan organizations that track all of these legislative changes, um, both the ones that have passed and also the ones that have been proposed and are currently being debated. Um, the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School has a really great tracker um, that they update pretty frequently. Um, there's an organization called Voting Rights Lab um, that has a really user-friendly um, sort of spreadsheet style database of, of voting bills that are being proposed in all the states. Um, so, you know, the resources are out there. Um, it can be kind of daunting to, to stay up to date, um, but those are a couple, a couple of good places to start. And Jesse, I saw maybe your hand go up. Did you have more to add there? I was gonna say the Voting Rights Lab and also the National Conference of State Legislatures has a terrific site where you can actually see what's already been enacted, what's still proposed, where it is in the, in the process and um, not just for this year, but for prior years as well. So you can see kind of the status of various bills that have been proposed and enacted in the states. Great, well, um, I think with that, we've reached the end of our program. So um, just a few uh, closing remarks and announcements. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much to Jesse, Jonathan, and Stephanie for their time and sharing their insights with us. Um, before we go, I'd like to share two slides. Um, you can find others who share your interests in politics or civil or voting rights by starting your own group on Meetup. And uh, as a special offer, we will uh, give you 50% off your first, uh, first subscription. So you can go to meetupsavings.com. Um, also, Meetup recently launched our podcast, Keep Connected with Meetup's CEO earlier this year. Please take a moment to take out your phone and scan the QR code to give it a listen. You can also download it on your favorite podcast um, apps. Uh, and as a reminder, you can view a recap of this event on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog in just a few days. So with that, thanks again for joining us and stay safe, everyone. Thanks.